Crystal, welcome. Hi, what's up? Thank you uh, for your time today on uh, Speaking from Water, episode 15. Um, should yeah, we get I'm excited. Let's do it. Sick, sick. All right, here we are, Speaking from Water, episode 15. I'm your host, Sean Rutke, in the EDA Surf Art Studio in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we are super honored right now to be with Krista Funk. And she is, what's up, guys? So um, we're extremely honored you're here. Um, first of all, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, subscribe, like the content. We don't take any sponsorships. Uh, it's all community run and funded. So um, with that said, uh, Krista is just an outstanding photographer. She has work that just blew my mind when I first saw it. Uh, one of our subscribers um, uh, got me into you. Uh, Rock is his name. I don't know if you're familiar with Rock, but uh, he said, you got to check out Krista. Uh, her work's amazing. Um, after doing some research, I found out you're not from Hawaii. You're from Colorado and you were in the Coast Guard. Thank you for your service. Um, you went on to, to just rule pipeline. So Without further ado, I want to I want to get right into it and um, and and ask you uh, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm good. I don't know if I would say rule pipelines. Like I've been out there like a hot minute compared to some of the other guys that are filming and shooting out there. So well, I feel like I'm modest. still I'm not new new, but I'm still pretty fresh in it. Well, people, she's very modest also, and um, her work speaks for itself. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very honored and impressed again to have you. So um, how is the surf today? It's flat. <laughs> yeah. This, this is what the it's linear, doing. The linear water. Yes, yes. Um, so um, I want to I wanna get right down, down to it. So you're from Colorado. Is this right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, you grew up swimming in, in pools, and uh, tell, us, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that and, and how it sprung, sprung you into the life you live now. Okay. Um, gosh. So I started when I was seven years old. We were living in Delaware at the time, actually. Um, my parents, one of their good friends, said, hey, bring your kids over to the pool. I'll have them join swim team and they can sail afterwards. It was right, um, it was Lewis Beach Yacht Club, but it was still, it was still that kind of classic style. It wasn't all fancy and new and um, she made us her, her permanent guest for the summer. And so I got to do swim team and I just loved being in the water. And it kept going from, that point and then I just I kept doing season after season and then we moved away from Delaware and um where we lived we were about maybe a mile from the beach and our parents had us there all the time and, and so I was about part of me for years old. what what would yeah. look like um we lived at, um right by Cape Henlope and State Park Oh, beautiful yeah I'm um I'm from Washington DC originally so Ocean City was my my oh, home my beach God. growing up so that's kind of like near Indian okay. River. Is that is that right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. and that same general vicinity. Um, okay. Trying to think, but we were there. We were there for four years, and then in two thousand one, I was eleven. We had moved back to Colorado, and I just remember thinking, oh, "How do I get back to the beach?" <laughs> like, I just I wanted to be back and near the water, and where I am, like the or where I was. Um, the mountains are amazing. Like it is a really fantastic area, and I really enjoy hiking and camping and snow. But just there's something about being in the water for me, kind of always. And so I kept doing swim team. Um, I did that through high school, and then I swam at the Coast Guard Academy too. I don't feel like I figured out necessarily really how to race until I finished at the Coast Guard Academy. And then I feel like I figured some things out in my head that like, 
It's start, I did open water swims when I first came out here before I got really into photography and it was like everything kind of clicked and I went oh this is what this is what I was missing like for a lot of those years felt like I would be really good in practice and then I'd get to meet and it'd just be like wait what are you two different people like what's what's going on here so um I don't know I just I love swimming and I I it was always my release. Like, I worked really hard in school, and I just, um, it gave me a break from everything and kind of like all the pressure that I'd put on myself to get good grades and keep going forward and try to achieve more. Like, it just was that break at the end of every day, getting into the water and just kind of going like tuning out so that was something I really craved and really enjoyed and wanted to have in my life and and when did you decide you wanted to get into the Coast Guard and and serve your country so that actually that started um oh gosh kind of the wheels were in motion for that um before I even knew it my um, my seventh grade geography teacher, Ms. Banal, she said um, to my dad at a parent-teacher conference, I see how Krista works in class and how she turns in, turns in assignments, and I think what I'm seeing now is a very good fit for a service academy. And so she just, she watched my habits and what I was doing, and she said, you know, when the time comes to have her figure out where she wants to go after high school, she really like have her look at the service academies. And so my dad, and so funny thing is, I actually had gone to the bathroom when they were talking about this. So I wasn't supposed to hear it. And I came out of the bathroom and I kind of stood like behind the wall off to the side. I don't think they realized I was there. And I heard the whole conversation and I went, there's no way I'm going to a military academy. What does that even mean? I don't want to go to military school. And I totally just like, I just mix it from that point on. And just Like my dad brings this up to me. I'm not going to do it. And anyways, that had happened. And then um, my dad kept bringing it up to me kind of when I was starting, not kind of, when I was starting to look at colleges and he kept saying, you know, look at a military academy, look at a military academy. And I either wanted to go into photojournalism or um, be a marine scientist. And so I just, I kind of was like, I don't know what to do. And my mom, um, my mom had said, you know, do the science first, get the hard stuff out of the way and then keep, shooting and taking photos and then you can do photography later and so I kind of went well how can I do that and so my dad my dad would like just keep bringing things up and kind of try to like wear you down with it um and I was talking to my sister Megan one evening and I was like I don't know what to do about this I should I do this should I apply should I not and she goes well why not and then I couldn't give her a reason for the life of me. I could not give her, I kept like bragging my brain to think of a good reason. And I went, I don't have a good reason not to. So I went over, um, I called my parents and I said, all right, I'm going to apply to a service academy, probably going to need your help. Um, so are you guys willing to help me out with this? I swear to God, I just remember my dad's eyes just lighting up and I was like, oh, Man, I said I wouldn't do this, but I'm doing it. And then um, it turned out to be the best thing because I got to study marine science. Um, and then I had, I was commissioned as an officer after the four year degree program. And I served for five years in the Coast Guard. And I was, at that point too, I'd matured enough where I went. I'm really grateful to have been able to serve my country and I love the US. So it was um it was pretty amazing to be able to do that and to have the opportunity to do that. And you do when you go to a service academy, you pay with time and the time that you give back to the Coast Guard, like that's your payment. 
Um, but I think even though it was pretty, I saw some things that were incredible and I had some fantastic times. And then even with like things that happened to me that were absolutely horrendous, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't change that path that I went on because then I did the science and then I, it like, I got into photography with, um, kind of in 2014, I started really doing photography part-time and really starting to build that up like with the water side of it. And so I had a secure job while I was starting and building into my photography career. So I want to get to the photography here in a second, but I want to kind of stay on this Coast Guard because I find it very interesting. Yeah. Um, so okay. when, when you were in the, in the academy, did you know where you were going to go? Um, was that a choice or were you, were you just like, I'm, I'm in this extreme thing for four years and then I'm going to be out. And like, how, how did you manage that in your, in your mental space? I, I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to get kicked out. I didn't want to quit. Um, I was, absolutely just I was so tenacious <laughs> like um I felt like I had I had this opportunity in front of me and I just I refused to let it go or screw it up and so I I put my nose to the grindstone and I worked and I had to study and I'm not one of those people that really gets things like right off the bat and then doesn't have to look at it ever again like I have to repeat things and go through it and study to memorize and retain information and so um I went in I'd get extra help but like I just it was just constantly working and exhausting myself so I could succeed because I didn't want to lose the opportunity of being able to study marine science and then come out and have a job and what went with that so I just that mental fortitude it was a lot it, in part two I knew I had like um my family all pulling for me and um they were just so supportive the whole time and yeah that's that's kind of how I did it and I had a lot of good friends but at the end of the day like there were a lot of times that I just had to buckle down and study and I felt like I was studying a lot um and then I was doing swim team and then you're doing 500 other things for military training so I spent a lot of those four years pretty exhausted but at the same time if you go to a regular university you're paying for your food you're paying for housing a car and classes and textbooks and all of that and so those are like those are things that I didn't even have to focus on or worry about. They were taken care of. Like my sole focuses when I was there, it was school, um, trainings, and then swim team and other sports when I wasn't in swim season. So, Amazing. so it was physically, very really centralized focus. <laughs> extreme. Yeah. And you come out and when did you find Hawaii? How did that enter the mix? Were you given a choice? Did they make the choice for you? Yeah. Um, so that was part of their incentive to get really like to um, get good grades there is that your class rank, the higher your class rank, the higher likelihood you'll have of getting placed where you want to go um, after you finish at the Coast Guard Academy. So they have a list of all of the jobs for officers and you get that list, everybody gets it and you create a dream sheet. And you pick out like places or jobs that you want. And then based on your class rank determines whether you get them or not. So if someone say is higher than you, puts down the job that you want and there's only one spot for that job, the person that's higher in the class will get that job over you. And so, I have heard, um, I guess it's just never say never, because I, heard, I during the summers, you have about three weeks off um, between your school semesters, 
that are like your off time and you can be home with family. The rest of the time you're doing like some kind of basically immersion training with the different missions in the Coast Guard. And I, my, the summer, it would have been my sophomore year. So the summer of my sophomore year, I went on a 378 foot, it's a cutter, but it's a 378 foot boat. And there were a ton of girls on there with me. And it was just like, I just, it was so, it seemed, it wasn't so big to me. I just, I didn't like it. I, we went to some amazing places, but I just, I didn't like the atmosphere. And I wanted, oh, this is definitely one of those places, like a boat that I don't want to go back to. I don't want to do this platform and be a part of a 378. I'm not going to do that when I graduate. I know I'm not going to. And so anyways, push comes to shove. Um, I need to pick my billet or pick where I want to go. And I'm kind of like maybe in the top, I'm in the top quarter of the class. So I, there's some jobs that I guaranteed like won't be competitive for, but there's a lot that I really was competitive for putting together my dream sheet. And I just, I wasn't getting excited about what I was putting down. And then I had talked to a friend and he told me, well, uh, Coast Guard, like the Cutter Rush out of, based out of Honolulu, Hawaii is going to be going to, he started listing a bunch of work. And then at the end of the day, um, I'd basically be getting the same um, qualifications that I would on other platforms and I had other friends applying to um, be on that boat and so there was a good group of us that were thinking about going to it and I just went you know what I'm gonna put this down I'm actually I'm excited for where they might go and its home port is in Hawaii and so I put it down and they ended up giving that to me as my billet. And so I was assigned to um, Coast Guard Cutter Rush for two years. And I said, I'd never go on a 378 foot boat again. And there I was. So yeah, that's how I ended up in Hawaii. I, so I kind of picked ish where I was gonna go, but some of it is up to deciding factors, other deciding factors. So you get to Hawaii and what year was this? That was 2012, summer 2012. And and it's a new place for you. You've never been there before. Um, I'd been there the summer before. Um, I had gone with, it was through the Coast Guard, actually. They randomly assigned me to sector Honolulu. And so I did um, like a six weeks in the summer um, on Oahu. So I did at least know kind of like, that I did like Hawaii and that I did like being on an island and I wasn't cagey because I'm there's you're on an island like some people get that they get really like oh, I can't drive anywhere far that kind of feeling um, which there's nothing wrong with that but I just I knew I didn't get that and so I wasn't too concerned about having that be an issue but so, I did I, I got out to Hawaii and then was on the boat <laughs> yeah so when was it, and I, maybe tell us the story, how did you discover the North Shore? Um, what was okay. that like the first time uh, walking out there at, at Pipe and, and you seeing this, this thing? Okay, okay. Sorry, I was only, I was only laughing because I think the first speech that I went to was, um, gosh, I think, I can't remember what it was. I just remember we, my friend and I were pulled over on the side of the road and this doesn't happen as much anymore. And I like, I don't even hear like cat calls for other women, but like freaking, oh, we had like three cars go by and it was just guys like cat calling. And I was just like, oh, okay. So that's how they're just like, that's how it is up here. Okay, sounds good. And then they were like, if there are other, like if there are other cars with girls, they're cat calling then she's like, we just heard it a lot, like even from the first visit, and now it's so tame up here. Like I don't hear that shit anymore. <laughs> it's like it's ridiculous. But anyways, my first experience with coming up to the North Shore was 
a lot of cat calling and um anyways freaking i'm trying to think so the first time i saw a pipeline um and that whole hmm, what was it i had started so what had happened was um i started when i came out here i started surfing and then my friend said oh you were a swimmer you should learn how to body surf and god i don't know i wish i'd been smarter thankfully i didn't break my neck but he taught me at sandy's i'm like it was a smaller day but still sandy's isn't where you go to learn the body surf that's just not it but i don't know it was it was so much fun. I don't recommend it for learning. Go to safer spots. Don't break your neck. It's not worth it. <laughs> like, really wait before you start body surfing there. Um, anyways, regardless, um, I had gotten into surfing and body surfing, and I was shooting photos like while we were on port calls, and one of my friends and like one of the groups of guys that would go surfing I had started surfing with those guys um and I felt like I don't know I felt like a kid sister like tagging along because they were so much better than I was but I knew like what I knew was surfing is that I could swim in after my board my board wasn't a flotation device if I lost my board I could swim in after it and so it was a lot of learning about the ocean that was like go that was going on for me and so anyways one of the guys had said hey krista this is ryan ryan goes you know you should shoot some surfing like shoot surfing you go out and then you're out for a couple hours and then the evening session like he's like get out an hour before sunset and just shoot he's like if you like shooting sports try surfing and just see if you like it and um i'd seen water photos too i'd seen a lot of water shots um and i particularly remembered like sean davies there was a book extreme sports photography that i had and sean davy had a section in there and his images really stuck with me and i just remember seeing him in high school and not knowing like how to do water shots necessarily or like having the money to get a water housing and anyways those are kind of like in the back of my mind and I was shooting surfing after uh, after I'd surf, and then I heard I found out there was going to be a swell at Pipeline, and it was late season. It was April, and I went to shoot it, and I was just I was watching it, and I saw the guys out there shooting, and I didn't know if they were men or women out in the water shooting. I just saw the little heads and cameras, and I went, I want to do that. I want to be out there doing that. I don't want to have to stand on the beach and do this. I want to be in the action. And so I saw a guy about to go out and um, he had his housing next to him. And I went up and introduced myself and his name was Kenji. And he said, oh, I've seen you body surfing at Sandy's. Like, um, if you're really interested in getting a water housing and eventually shooting out here, like um let me know when you have a housing and i'll take you out for a small day at sandy's because summer is coming up and so he took me out for my first small day at sandy's and then he said after that session because it was just one session he said um keep shooting throughout the summer see how you like it and then if you want to at whatever point you're ready to go out on a small day at pipe just give me a call and let me know and so that's where it all started and so I talked to him like I talked to him and then I got my water housing and I started shooting really small days in town at like um bulls and kewallows and just going after work because I, I worked in town at the time and um it just kind of kept tumbleweeding and I'd go out on progressively bigger days and I kept saying like you know, if I need to go in at any point because it's too big, I know I can swim in and I can get myself in because I'm not going to go out if I don't think I can swim in and out safely. Like, and I still apply that rule now. Like, if I don't think I can get out of the water on my own, then I don't go in. Um, so regardless, it just, it, it continued on and I, um, I kept shooting and going out on those bigger days and then 
kind of when winter started coming around, I went, well, I want to shoot pipe and that's in the staff lab. So I'll start at Rocky Point and start shooting there. And um, I started small days at Rockies and then I worked my way up. And then eventually I finally was like, okay, I think I'm ready, ready to call Kenji. And it seemed like all my stuff was getting into the water photography happened really quick. But I think it was honestly like all of my experiences, like with starting photography when I was 13 and everything like kind of coming together, all of the years I spent swimming and like back and forth in the pool and my events were distance events. And so I would swim for long distances. And so all of that experience just started like combining together. And then um, I went out and I, he took me out for the first time at Pipe and he showed me how to kind of like go in and how you go out, like go in, go out to the lineup and then come in and where the danger areas were. And um, he told me about how different fall directions work there and kind of what their typical behavior is. And that was like, that was the lesson that I got from him. And he said, all right, you gotta, you can take it from here. And then I just kept going to pipe on progressively bigger days and kept building that up. So it was all kind of a progression and it looked like it happened really what I'm doing now. So it wasn't like an overnight thing. That's my very long answer to your. No, I, I love it. I love it. I want to follow up. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the, in that progression, I know you probably, got more and more confidence because it's very intimidating seeing that for the first time um the pipe yeah. uh, it's yes. still intimidating now yeah, right right you walk up and it's like spinning out of like pipe and back door and it's big or it's just big and west and pipe and fucking just fire hydrant sprays there's so much ass out there behind like those swells it's still intimidating i mean i'm gonna be I'll be kind of concerned if I ever don't feel intimidated when I see that. Like that's when I might actually just stop myself from going out altogether and really think things through. Like, so what was there a point or a moment where you got in over your head in this progression where uh, one day you were like, this is too much. I need to turn down the volume a little bit. Well, yes, there was, the first day that I shot when it was like, I want to say it was like eight to 10 feet. So like 16 to 20 foot faces. Um, I got out and I wasn't using uh, a leash for my housing at the time. And I had a rented port on there and I was like, man, I really, I need a leash. Like I need to get a leash going good and I had a rented 70 to 200 sport and I was like I'm just gonna grip it really tight I know that you can grip things really like how insanely hard you can grip something if you don't want to let go it's um it's actually pretty incredible if you want to side note look that up ever but anyways that was my flawed logic going out and so I get out and there's a rogue set um I get caught and getting exploded and tossed everywhere half of the lineup getting smoke and i'm tumbling 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 and then the camera's gone and it just was like this no <laughs> and then i come up and i'm out of breath and i'm like well, what the fuck just happened i remember um koa smith was kind of like maybe like six feet um further out to sea than i was and I just yelled, I was like, hey, do you see a camera floating around by chance? And it was like, I swear in my head, there was like this heavenly light. He's like, oh, it's right there. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> and swam nice. up to it all out of breath and like going, and I checked everything and it was fine. And I got really lucky. And I was like, then I was worried about myself. I was like, oh, am I actually okay? going <laughs> really you're worried about your camera more than you're worried about yourself no no 
Um, and I was fine. And I can't remember if I, I can't remember honestly if I swam back out or not that day or if I went in for a little bit and regrouped and got a leash and then went back out. I think, I think the second scenario is what happened. Not entirely positive. I just remember just seeing this like holy light come down with like all this whitewash about to like coming in the distance and it's about to hit it again. <laughs> That's me being like, no. So, um, I think it was an over my head. I didn't necessarily have the right equipment because I didn't have that leash on that camera, and it was big. And thankfully, I didn't get hurt. And I also was wearing a wetsuit, so I wasn't scraped up from it. You know what I mean? And I always have a helmet on. And um, but that was one of those things where I was like, okay, maybe I just need to. Rain it in a little bit, rain it in, but um, me being me, I took it as a lesson and then ran with it and then shot bigger days that winter, like shot some bigger days after that. So. But the thing is, it stayed the same with like always going, um, if it's too much for me to handle, I know I can swim in. Like, I can get myself in. If it's too much, I'll go in. And just always having that thought in the back of my head. So that was kind of where I kept just going forward with it, with being like, too much, I just go in, no questions asked, and it's okay. Now, yeah. the aesthetic is extremely unique to your, your work. And I want to kind of get into that and how you found your own way of doing things. Um, you're an artist. How did you develop your your unique style? It, was, it, was it more technical, um, more of a philosophy kind of? Break that down for for us if you could. Gosh, um, I think I think style. I think a, a very large part of style is um, who the person is. I think that's reflected in photos. I think like that can really come out and how people edit and present their work. Um, I, how did my this is quickly saw me get ahead of the and about um, shooting with a film camera and so I. It took off basically. I got, she had me recommended for a film photography class that only juniors and seniors were in um, my freshman year of high school. And then I did an independent study year my sophomore year. And then I was on our high school um, newspaper for the next two years. I was a photojournalist and then a photo editor for them. And it was, we had such a killer setup as a side note. It was, awesome to do that um and then when I was in college I took um my senior year my grades were high enough that I could do an elective at Connecticut College and I took a uh, digital photography and film class again for a semester and so I kind of always I kept shooting and building that knowledge base and I think kind of um I think my style came from really learning photography and learning about it um, to then applying to figure out like how to get what I was seeing and what I wanted to show someone to translate into an actual photograph. Um, and I, that just took time. And then even, even my editing, when I started, I was still primarily using Photoshop and Kenji, um, he comes back into the story because I took a class on how to use Lightroom 101. It was a basic it was like a three-day course that we did with him. Um, there was a group of us and he went through the basics of Lightroom with us because I really didn't know and I wanted to get a solid foundation to start using it. And that's what I got from his course. And so even when I started Lightroom, I said your photos are good and your editing's good, but they just don't have that like extra umph yet, like that extra bit that makes it go that makes the image really like stand out 
And so that was kind of what my was in my mind as the goal to getting to that point. And um, with Lightroom, I feel like my style started out pretty dark. Um, and I was in a really, I, I was in a really difficult spot personally um, with things that were going on at work and things that had happened to me. And so it kind of, it almost feels like it's reflected in how I was editing. Like it was very kind of dark to start out and um, kind of as the years have gone on and I've worked through things and um, kept moving forward, it started getting lighter. And I started, um, even when I had gotten, when I finished in the Coast Guard in 2017, um, I edited wedding photos for um, my friend and her mom. They have a mother-daughter team, absolutely loved on the North Shore and they shoot weddings and they needed someone to come in and help edit. And I went, oh, I can do that as a side job while I'm like working on getting my photography to take off like on my own. And so that was like, I'd go to their house a couple times a week and I would edit photos for them. And so I started learning more about like doing, working with skin tones and that translated to skin tones and surfing photos and then skin tones and my diving pictures and like all of my learning like just added onto itself. And then a ton of repetition there's so many hours spent editing but I felt like as I started to go into a lighter place in my life my photos got lighter and kind of less like heavy contrast feeling and um so I feel like kind of my style has kind of changed but as far as the uniqueness goes it's just I think it's just how I see things and what I'm seeing in my head, I'm trying to get to the person that I'm showing the picture. And I just, I want to give people like photography for me is like a release and it's a going into the water and kind of tuning out everything else and just being focused on what's happening in that moment. Like when people look at my photos, I kind of, I want to give them like, give them that feeling and give them at least, even if it's just a little, like a piece of it to just have like one or two seconds where it's like a break from everything else that might be going on for them because that's what it really like that's what it is for me is that kind of break and like I don't know finding the light even when it's not necessarily like I don't know it's not necessarily the light so on these on these days where you're you're out you're going to go shoot how do you decide what it is that you're going to put in your water housing, uh, whether it's like a fisheye or a zoom, like does that existential yeah. threat of like n n decision um, kind of like tweak you out? I know it does me personally, but I've combated okay. it with my, myself, but I, I want to know from you, um, like do you have a hard idea of what you want to do or do you just like flip the dice and say, okay, we're going with this? Whoa, okay. I don't flip the dice on those. Um, cause fish eye on big days at pipe. Pipe is not a machine. It breaks. It doesn't really break consistently in the same exact spot. So fish eye, I tend to be like careful to the point where I hardly shoot fish eye at pipe and I shoot it at other breaks and other waves because it's where you have to sit and like where you have to be. It's, and depending on the day, like I'm talking like a giant day, like a massive west and going out and shooting fish eye, like I, that's not, that doesn't really, I don't know. It's just shifty and unpredictable and there's so much force and I don't want to break my back over trying to stick my arm up in the barrel and it could feel amazing and be adrenaline rushing, but like, um, when I'm looking at pipe, I'm looking and going like, okay, what can I shoot with? Um, is it consistently breaking further back and being a little shifty? Um, then I use like a 70 to 200. But if it's like kind of going all over, then I'll pick a different lens. And sometimes I'll do a wide angle, like um, a 16 to 35 or um, 
I'll do another lens I really like is 24 to 105 because it gives you a wide range. Um, but it's just, I'll look at the conditions that day and make that decision. I won't ever just be like, actually, I've done this before where I've just been like, I really want to shoot, um, I really want to shoot this 50 today or something or 16 to 35 at 16 because that's what I want to do today. And then I get out and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing shooting <laughs> like 16 millimeters? And it's, this isn't conducive to getting good shots right now, personally. Um, just like, so you can't, you have to look at conditions and kind of base your lenses based on what the conditions are doing. That's the short version of what I'm trying to say is like, don't, and I've done that too, where I've just with surfing, where I'm like, I just want to surf this board. And then I take it out and I'm like, why am I on this board? <laughs> like, I should have grabbed this one and not worried about it type of thing. So it's kind of that same thought process. It's not like you go into the surf to go for a surf without looking at what the waves are doing first and just have your one board unless um you're poor and you only have one board or something and you can't afford any and you've got one and that's your only board um but if you have options you want to look at the surf and kind of gauge what you should use and, and what lens so it is hard though because sometimes you do look at it and gauge it and then you're like oh, i should be using this one <laughs> like you just gotta kind of let that go sometimes too and just not kick yourself over it too much like there's only so much you can do what what of your collection of of work uh, that you've that when you when you see it in your viewfinder after a session you're like that's what's up that's like it just fills you with, with joy what what content is, is that? Um, oh, let's see what content is that. Um, I actually I try really hard unless I have to just to check to make sure my settings are good like. I don't look at my pictures until I get them on my computer because I've had too many times I've seen them on the viewfinder on my camera, I've gotten so excited and then like, that's amazing. And then I get it home and it's like just enough out of focus and it's not salvageable. And you're just like, because ah, you thought you had something good and then it's not there. Um, I think one of the lessons I learned when I first started to from Kenji was he said, he just told me, it was like, if you get one good photo out of a water photography session when you're shooting surf, he's like, that is something. Just said, it's so hard. And if you get even one good one, then you've done a great job. So just don't, like, just don't go into it being like, I have to get like X amount of good shots. He's like, enjoy being in the water and um, just keep working at it. But sometimes you will only come out with one and sometimes you will come out of the water with no good shots. So just kind of like keeping that in mind and having that in mind, I think like um, when I do get that one good shot or when I'm going through on the computer, it's just, um, I don't know, it's more, I think the images that stand out to me are, kind of more unique looking waves and then kind of the ones that mutate and do weird things that you don't expect um and i really i i don't honestly i one of the things i really try hard to do because i've seen so many photographers do it is they blow out spots they take their camera there they show the background people figure out where it is and then suddenly a, like an area that wasn't crowded turns into a crowded spot. And um, I don't want to do that. I really don't. So if I have an opportunity to shoot somewhere that's more of like a secretive spot, I won't show the background. And then I'll put it out way later, way after I shot it. So you can't figure out where I was or when it was. Um, but to that note, I love having background in my photos. I love giving something like a sense of place. And I don't mind doing that so much with the North Shore because the North Shore is like not like the spots that I'm shooting at, they're they're blown out. Like they're known. It's not a secret that Sunset Beach is not a secret, Pipe isn't a secret, Rockies isn't. Like these are all places that are 
on the third destination map and they've been there for a while, like why may I? All of those. So like if I include background and I have a picture that's like good for the surfing and then has background incorporated, I get so excited. I love seeing that. So yeah, that's what I like. Awesome. What are you doing now that you find most progressive about your work and exciting? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I'm building relationships that I'm really excited about with, um, <laughs> sorry, wait, um, like just building relationships with companies that I really enjoy working with and people that I enjoy working with and um, having those like come together with me getting jobs and going and getting sent out for shoots and that kind of a thing and feeling like I'm really able to do this job on my own terms. Like I realize it's a freelance job, but I'm not like, um, fighting for tiny social media jobs shooting for one for a small brand like I'm, I'm out of that and I'm and there's nothing wrong with being in that stage but I'm out of that more and I'm at a point where I'm like I'm able to work with companies that I really like and focus on those and go from that and develop those relationships so that's really exciting to me and has been um a lot of fun and just even getting to that place where like i'm selling pictures and then they're a poster in a store like that's the freaking coolest because i remember going into like my sister worked in a mountaineering store in college and i remember seeing like um patagonia photos on the wall and posters and going like how do i shoot for something like how do i shoot for like patagonia or how do i work for like something like that well, that looks like photography that I'd love to do because it looks like they're always like in the action or like in it with the person that they're shooting and um yeah I started working a lot with Patagonia and building that relationship and that's just been really fantastic and then got a women's brand title nine that I shoot with and it's just awesome working with different teams and people and meeting people that you like and kind of building on those. And then, oh man, the backpack company that I get my photo bags from, DB, these formerly douchebags, but they came to America and had to tone it down apparently. But um, sorry, I probably shouldn't. Political correctness. Sorry, sorry, I'm sensitive. I'm not sensitive. I'm, gosh. Um, foot and mouth. I'm going to stop while I'm ahead, but I liked douchebags. I thought it was hilarious. Anyways, um, they're awesome too. Like working for them, like I got to meet their team this year to send a bunch of us out to France to meet everybody on that team. And it was like, I would honestly want it. Like not one of you makes me feel cringy and go, I hate marketing. <laughs> And makes me feel like I just been like, oh, this guy's a cheese ball. Why do I have to? I'm just gonna be nice and it's gonna be fine and I'll be professional and then I don't have to see them again. It was all people that I was going, man, I want to hang out with you again. Like I don't want to just see you this one time and never see you again. So it's just like putting together that and getting to that point in my career has been um, very challenging hard to get to but very well worth it and I'm very excited to um what it might lead into very excited about what it might lead into there we go got my words <laughs> confused Beautiful. sorry no, yeah you you hit it and um I guess what what people who might um aspire to do what you do does it how does that that business model work do you do the work first in in the in the pipe and then you have like this battery of, of content that you're like, hey, I got this. Um, and then then they're like, oh, okay, go to France. Or um, how, how does how does how does how do the, how do the stepping stones work? Um. Okay, so surfing surf industry is very tiny, um, and I think 
I literally, I don't have, my connection to the surf industry is approximately nil. Like I wasn't going in there with like my so-and-so was this, my so, like my family member did this in surfing or my family was like so involved with this aspect of it or they founded this. And like, so I went in there with like cold turkey basically. And it was starting with building relationships with people and meeting people and shooting everyone and then sending them their photos and then kind of getting starting to get linked up with like brands through people that I was shooting and then kind of going from there and just like building off of having relationships with people and meeting people and talking to people and um I think to like there's so many I'm just like there's so many different offshoots to where I could go with this but it all starts with just um shooting and putting your work out there I think social media helped me not get buried by photo editors um I think I think if I sent my work into some photo editors I think I would have gotten like lost in them basically you know I, I don't know if I would have gotten where I am right now like I don't know if it would have progressed the same um but that being said like social media and then um even oh my gosh Pete Hodgson saw one of my photos and he told Surfline about me and he said you guys you should watch her like see what she does and so Surfline really was the first um like media to publish any of my work so thank you surfline but uh side note um so it was surfline and then eventually like free surf started to let me in and like the local publication so it all started like small i didn't just start working for bigger brands or bigger companies and it was all freelance and i did i spent i still send a lot of stuff a lot of content into companies as a freelancer um and that's kind of that's kind of the way it goes and then you start to meet people and you start to shoot with people more and you build on relationships that's kind of that's a progression that i feel like i've taken and also i think a big part of it too is you have to let your work do the talking don't talk about how great you are or how awesome you are like put your work out there and let that speak for you and then back it up with having a good work ethic and it'll come together but you have to you have to want it if you are half in with photography you're not going to go anywhere you have like you have to be so like tunnel vision focused with it for it to be something that you can actually pay the bills with and especially when I was first starting, just having the Coast Guard as my main job and my primary focus and having that paycheck, like, I wasn't reliant on, like, when I was learning, there wasn't that pressure to be like, well, I have to be good right away. There was, like, I had room to breathe because I had the military and, um, yeah, I was able to do it, like, pockets of time when I had time off. I, like, I would go shoot. And so... I didn't have that, oh, I can't pay my bills if I don't sell these photos type of thing, like breathing down my neck. So that was something I did have going for me. And I was also like out working in the local community too. And I met people in the community and kind of worked for the community before I started, before I shifted into photography too. And I think that helped with relationship building too. So it's all like these little additive factors that come together with that. Yeah, your career and life is very serendipitous. You, it all, it's all very tightly connected. Um, I, I want to uh, ask you a couple more questions. And um, wh where have you, uh, where have you not been that you really want to go? I really feel like I, I want to go. Um, I want to go to Ireland, and I want to explore New Zealand as well. Um, and then possibly like um, different parts of France too and that coastline is massive. Like there's 
there's so much to it. So I, yeah, kind of where I haven't been that I'd like to go. Incredible. Uh, what advice do you have for young people or young people at heart that want to get into water photography? Um, let's see. I feel like I, um, I just talked about some of it, but the main thing is being very focused on it and being always being willing to put your work out there. Like send your work in once you start getting like good content, like submit your work for awards, submit like your work to magazines and to companies, like submit fearlessly and be able to take a no. And at least you got the opportunity by submitting your work to give them a chance to say yes or no. Like always submit your work. And then if they say no, that's the worst they can do. Okay, it was a no for that. Great, go on to the next thing. Like even if that's, sometimes it's really hard because you put a lot into like what you might be sending, but it's like, all right, I just have to keep moving forward and on to the next one. But if you don't submit your work and you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't think it's good enough, or you kind of vacillate like that, um, like you're never going to end up wanting to, you're never going to submit your work. You're not even giving them the chance to tell you no, and they might actually say yes. So give yourself the chance to get a no, like, because you might succeed and it might go and it might happen and it might actually be a really good thing. And sometimes submitting can be really intimidating, but just be patient, read your emails a couple times through to make sure you don't sound like a moron and go for it. <laughs> like, that's kind of, that's, that was the best advice. And I got that advice from my journalism teacher, Mark Newton. He got really upset with me because I didn't, um, I didn't submit for a, like a journalism, contest and I said oh I you know I don't think I'd get it and he's like well now you really won't get it because you didn't submit it he's like you could have gotten something out of it but you'll never know now because you didn't give yourself the opportunity to succeed so submit fearlessly if you want to be a water photographer submit and be locked in on what you're doing and go for it completely. And if you have to have a part-time job while you're doing it, you might have to have a part-time job to like get yourself started, but be very focused and intent on that. And ooh, another piece of advice, because there's, my friend has a joke with me. She calls me like, like, are you photographer Krista or are you surfer Krista today? And it's like, if this like always, always prioritize work, like the fun can, you can wait for the fun, like prioritize your work. If the waves are good, go out and shoot the surf. Like if the waves are good and the lighting's good, go out and shoot surfing. And then um, when the wind is wrong and the waves aren't that great, then go out and surf. And you won't be sitting there feeling guilty while you're surfing going, I should be shooting right now. So always prioritize doing the photography first. Um, you're a water photographer and know how to swim and don't rely on a vest as a flotation device. That's not good. <laughs> like, know how to swim before you do it. There's, oh my gosh. Yeah, so just, yeah. So, Start with swimming. so do, you still yeah. swim, do you still swim every day for exercise? Um, I'm in, I don't swim in a pool every day for exercise, no, but I, Every day I'll wake up, I'll do yoga, and then I'll do some kind of lifting. If it's if the waves are over eight feet high, I don't lift in the morning. Um, and then I will be doing something active during the day, whether it's shooting, whether it's surfing or body surfing or going for a beach run or jumping in the ocean and swimming laps. Like there's always an active component to my day, um, especially if I'm not having a long shooting day. And yeah, there's always, there's always something active involved in it. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so here's, here's my big question for you. Uh, the, the finale, what, what is the meaning of life according to Krista Funk? 
42. That's according to Douglas Adams, though, so actually I can't take credit for that one. Um, oh, the meaning of life. Um, Hold up. What did you say, 42? Yeah, it's a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, well, yes, yes, yes. If you're, yeah, we can, we can run away from that reference. If you don't know it, it's okay. We can move along. Um, I can't believe I just did this as a hand gesture. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, these are not the draw. Okay, I'm going to stop being a nerd. Um, <laughs> sorry. Meaning of life, according to me. Um, Take care of your family and friends and the people that legitimately care about you as a person and don't just want something from you. Um, take care of them. Keep people around that'll tell you that your fart smell. Like, <laughs> I can I can show my husband a picture and he can say, no, it's really not it. And I can go, oh, dang. But at least I have someone that's not telling me my stuff's great all the time. And keep those people in your corner. Um, and that's, that's in the photography sense. I know that's not the meaning of life, but like you want to have people like that around, like, even if you aren't in that kind of job environment, that'll just say, basically, um, and then just to just, you can't put stake in what people think of you. You can only be like act and react in certain situations and that's what's in your control. And if you want something in life um, to be very tenacious and go for it and don't shy away from the mundane or the hard work because usually what you fight for the hardest is what ends up being the most worthwhile. So. Um, be grateful that you have an opportunity to live and I don't know, you can't control what circumstances you're born into. You can't control who your parents are, but you have to be willing to fight to make the best of whatever your situation is. And I think um, in that you can find a life that has meaning and is worthwhile to you as a person. Beautiful. So we just went up to 10,000 feet. Now I want to go back down to the sea level with the same kind of question. What does the aesthetic of water mean to you? Like, what what is it about water that is just so amazing? I think it's because I, it just, it always calmed me down. Um, I'm very high energy. Like, I'm like, um, and so it always was something like I'd go and I'd go to swim practice after school and I'd have school all day, but I'd still have like pent up energy from sitting all day. And so I'd go and I'd swim and it would just tire me out to the point where I could relax and actually really focus. Um, because I'm in, like, I feel like I can, I get very easily distracted unless I'm very intent on a project or exactly what I'm doing and so like being in the water always kind of like wear me down and then I'd be able to focus and it was always like this like extra energy like this push of like whatever I had in me like would go out or like if there was anything tense or a test that I was anxious about or stuff going on at home or stuff going like as I got older things going on at work like I could just I could swim and I could do laps and I could put it in the water and it just, it calms me down. Like even just like that first, like jump into the water and that like cool feeling that you get, it just like kind of just like levels me out. And so I think the aesthetic with water and what draws me to it is that relief. And also um, just it's, if you're in nature, like I studied marine biology and I wanted to be in the water all the time. And I didn't, I did not like data entry. I would collect sea urchins for you all day off the bottom. Like send me out. Just don't put me like doing number entry and analyzing the numbers. Like, um, so just like being able to get in the water and to see it, um, 
when it's massive and there's waves or when it's smaller and there's still all that energy in the ocean and then going down to like even shooting underwater it's like seeing all the different sides of it and being in that environment was something that I wanted and I get to do it consistently with um, how my life has gone and how I've set up my life and so um, just being able to have that is something I love and seeing how the like the sun reflects in the water and like what it does and different light levels and how colors change and like like even just the light going through a barrel it's like so good um and I think those are all like kind of like the personal aspect and then like in actually being in nature and then like getting the opportunity to like share that feeling with people through my work that kind of all pulls me like to the water and want to be in the water hopefully that makes sense hopefully yeah. i like put a bow on that very yeah, roundabout that. That. <laughs> yeah. okay great that was amazing <laughs> yeah. sorry well, that was my ringtone there's no Actually, that'd be great. I'm just going to go to my, you know, my casual showdown <laughs> in the Old West, obviously. I don't know. I have wittier things, Tombstone, going through my head. Anyways, moving on. Well, yeah. Um, it was so much fun to talk to you. Yeah, Krista, Thanks this has been amazing, like epically beautiful. Nice. I, um, we're going to have this for eternity to stoke out the next generation. And I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time and um, and sharing your, your, your life with us today. Right on. Well, thanks for having me, Sean. And I hope you have a fantastic day. How's the yeah, surf where you too. are? You guys have hurricanes, don't you? Yeah, we, uh, we have one that's going to spin over Florida and come up the coast in a couple of days. It's going to go like six feet, which is great for us. So we're, uh, we're super yeah. stoked. And um, I, I, I usually go out to Hawaii in the wintertime. So I'll, I'll hit you up um, and, uh, Give you a high five or something. That'd be sick. Fuck yeah. Let me know. Sorry. You ever out here sorry. in Wrightsville Beach? <laughs> what? You ever uh, out here in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina? Um, Yeah, look us up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely will. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yay. Right on. Well, have a good day, Sean. You too. We'll, we'll be in touch. Bye. Bye. See you, Crystal. See you, Crystal.